Good morning and welcome all to Hear Me, See Me, the 2021 Missouri Higher Education Equity and Missouri Higher Education Summit. My name is Sarah Sammons, Senior Research Analyst with the Missouri Department of Higher Education and Workforce Development. And my name is Sam Bajak, Senior Research Analyst with the Missouri Department of Higher Education and Workforce Development. Sarah and I are co-planners of the event this year and we're this year's MCs. We're live via WebEx meeting presenting this year's summit. This is the third year that our department has hosted an equity summit and we're delighted that so many of you equity champions from all over the state and all over the country are with us today. As we kick things off, we'd like to know where you're joining us from. So let's light up the chat box with our first interactive question. What institution or organization are you from? You'll see this question come across the chat. As we watch the responses roll in, maybe you'll see somebody that you know or someone you met in one of our breakouts or somebody else that you might want to connect with. But here's a couple reminders about how to get the most out of this virtual event. Um, we request that all participants stay muted to eliminate background noise. Uh, we would love to see your faces, so if you have a camera, please turn it on to better engage with us. All the presentations will be live, so bear with us on any technical issues. We'll be monitoring the chats for any questions throughout the presentations. If you enter a session and decide it's not for you or decide a different breakout might be a better fit, um, please just close out and head to a different, se a different session just like you would at an in-person conference. Um, all the sessions are going to be recorded and they will be posted afterwards so you will be able to access them after the conference. And don't forget to engage with us on social media throughout the day using the hashtag equity2021 or tagging us at mo d h e w d and visiting our new conference website. And now it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Mara Woody, Assistant Commissioner of Post-Secondary Policy at the Missouri Department of Higher Education and Workforce Development, and Dr. Paul Katnick, Assistant Commissioner of Educator Quality at the Missouri Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Welcome both of you. Good morning. So Good morning. Thank you, Sarah, for having us on. Good morning. Well, today's format is going to be a little bit different. So we're going to do kind of a, a, a mini panel, if you will, where I will be asking um, Dr. Woody and Dr. Katnick questions, and then they will share their responses. So, um, and then as well, if any of you have questions for Dr. Katnick and Dr. Woody, um, you can put them in the chat as well. And if we have time to get to those, we certainly will. So let's kick things off. Um, so, Paul, I'm going to ask you this question first, and that, excuse me, Dr. Katnick, I'm going to ask you this question first, <laughs> and then um, and then uh, Dr. Woody will will also chime in. So the first question is, what are the biggest barriers standing in the way of students accessing and attaining a quality education? Well, good morning, everybody, and Paul is fine. Sarah, thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, Good morning, everyone. Glad to be here. You know, I was thinking about this question before we came on, and I and I think I hate to say because it it's I think it's something that we have so little control over. But you know, data would point to one of the barriers. You know, for accessing attaining quality education ends up being your zip code, and we don't have any we don't have any choice in which zip code we're born into. But if you look at the data, it kind of plays out that way. If you're a person born into poverty, if you're if you're a person of color. Already, there's some guesswork that can be made about how well you're going to access quality education, what you're going to attain, how far you can go. It doesn't mean that has to happen, but too often than not, the, the data kind of bears that out. There's other markers too: kindergarten readiness, uh, reading by third grade level, and it it always makes me think of this this movie that that I saw as a younger kid, uh, the original version of Back to the Future with Michael J. Fox. For those of you who are familiar with it. Um, he goes back in time because he's trying to intervene in one trajectory of his life. His parents never meet, never get married, and then him and his brother and sister are never born. And in the other trajectory, they do meet, and of course, they have these three kids. And throughout the movie, he's got a picture of him and his brother and sister in his hand, and he's watching them fade as the one trajectory becomes kind of the way it's going to take. But you can intervene and change those things. And I think those of us in the education community have to keep in mind that folks are on kind of a guesswork trajectory of how they're gonna end up. And it's our job to intervene, to give them the best possible resources we can to make sure that we get them to a different outcome than where we think it's gonna end up. So I think that ends up being a barrier. You almost start 
uh, with with some stuff stacked against you. And we have to be aware of that and be ready to kind of intervene and plan for something different. So something that so what Paul said actually is really powerful whenever I think about it, because when we think about barriers in post secondary education, there is often a social perception about the level of responsibility a person has for those barriers. And so what we find is change can be difficult because of those perceptions that it's somehow your fault or you somehow had a choice. But what Paul said really resonates with me that you don't choose what zip code you're born into. That isn't something that isn't your fault. And so whenever we back up and we look at education as an entire pipeline, you can see that there are things that happen that play out through a individual's lifetime. And so for me, I think the biggest barrier that you face in post-secondary education is the perception of the barriers. If people saw those barriers differently, then it would be easier to make the change. And so that's what we as equity leaders across the state are grappling with are these social perceptions. And so for me, it's kind of a two part answer playing off what Paul said is for me, for higher education, the biggest barrier is the perception of the barriers and that's what prevents the real change. But then whenever you step back and you look at it using the K-12 through higher education, looking at early childhood education all the way up through post-secondary education, you can, I really like the analogy of the back to the future that, you know, it wasn't necessarily, Marty got a time machine, nobody else gets time machines. So you can't necessarily change the trajectory of your own life and all circumstances, but the intervention of that, I think is a really important conversation that, you know, what happens early on plays out through the rest of your life. And we need to be more cognizant of that as a society whenever we talk about the barriers that students face to accessing quality education. Okay, great, thank you. And thank you for that back to the future analogy. I love that movie. And actually kind of funny, um, our theme at, um, at Dude today is uh, we're kind of doing a Halloween theme. And so I'm dressed up like a 1950s housewife, but I put a nice little blazer on so you can't tell. And I think Jessica, our assistant commissioner of communications and outreach is dressed up like a 90s girl. So if, anyway, so that's perfect. All right. So, um, so let's talk a little bit about some of the ways that your department is addressing these barriers. So um, Mara, if you want to kick it off, you can. Sure. Uh, so I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention it pre COVID post COVID, because as much as no one wants to talk about COVID anymore, COVID has had a huge implication in all of our lives. So pre COVID, our department was already invested in equity as everyone who's attending this morning is it's very important to us. So we had already launching our equity reports that we do every year. We have this. This is our 3rd year of the equity summit. Uh, last year, we launched our Bridges to Success monthly equity webinar, and we started writing equity white papers. All of that was really to bring awareness to the issues facing our state, and in some cases, our nation around equity and inequitable outcomes. And then COVID hit, and that kind of changed everything everyone was doing. And it actually became this incredible opportunity for us as a department to work outward and inward. And so what happened when COVID hit was as a state, our agencies have worked together in ways they never have before. And so we really ended up closing a lot of these silos that exist in these agencies. And we built incredible relationships working on COVID with other agencies. And so from that, we were actually able to build some partnerships. What COVID did was we all worked in equity before COVID, but COVID really brought issues to the forefront and it made conversations the forefront. We talk about broadband internet today very differently than we did two years ago. We talk about mental health today very differently than we did two years ago. And those are things that COVID really brought to light for us. So that way it becomes more of the mainstream conversation and people are more in recognition of the issues and more aware of them and want to be part of helping to solve the issues. And so whenever we started working in the COVID work and we saw these areas of need, students with mental health issues, students who aren't able to access services like they need to because of the COVID shutdown, we partnered with some of our state agencies. We actually last year placed social workers on several of our college campuses. We expanded that this year and we're going to expand it more next year. And that was in partnership with Department of Social Services. 
we also in partnership with Department of Mental Health and Sarah was the one who really launched this initiative, created a happier you program for students uh, that are dealing with mental health issues right now. And shameless plug, if anyone's interested in learning more about either of those programs, we will put our email address in the chat, reach out, we wanna connect and we wanna expand this so it can access as many students as possible. And I won't give it away because I think it's a question coming up, but we also were partnering with Desi well before COVID, through COVID and into the future. And so I'm gonna give a little teaser about there will be more coming when, with our uh, Desi question when that comes up. But then also there's what we're doing right now. And then the, what there's, there's what we're going to do after COVID as well or after the, the fallout of COVID, I suppose. Um, and so as part of our strategic plan, we're really wanting to expand the populations that we reach, and we're really wanting to walk alongside our institutions and support them in this work. And so we're gonna continue what we're already doing, but then we also wanna look at adult populations. We wanna understand where our institutions are struggling and where they need supports from us and where we can better support them with their work. All of that's kind of the external work. Then there was also the internal look work where, you know, as many of us were locked down for quite some time, you had some time to think about yourself and what you're doing. And as a department and as an office, one of the things we reflected on is, are we doing the best that we can? And then are there areas that we could update or change? And so we're actually doing an internal review of our policies and our rules to see, are there things that we might be exacerbating inequities and didn't even realize it? So that way we can make those changes internally, just like we're asking everyone else to. So really as terrible as COVID is, it has actually created some incredible momentum where it made real a lot of these issues we've been talking about. It's put it at the forefront, forefront and now we have new populations engaging with us in the discussions about how do we fix these issues. And so that's where our department is planning on moving forward with is what can we do and what can we continue to do and how can we grow to serve uh, in the future. There are a number of, of, of different things that we're working on. I think I want to zero in on what I think is the most important. And so you go back over 50 years ago, a, a Harvard sociologist, James Coleman, was asked to do a study on um, equality of educational opportunity. <clears throat> and what they wanted him to find out was, of all the things we can do in education, which one matters the most? Like, is it curriculum? Is it the materials you put in kids' hands? Is it the way you group students? Is the way you configure classrooms? Um, that's what they wanted him to check. Where should we put our efforts? And he actually came back with a finding that no one really sent him to go find. And that was, well, sure, you can put your time and money into all that. But at the end of the day, it's the quality of the teacher and the quality of their teaching that matters more than anything else. And in the 50 years that have followed since then, hundreds of researchers have all come back to the same conclusion. When it comes to great access to high quality learning, it's about the teacher and the quality of teaching. And that ends up being bad news for the state of Missouri. <laughs> so I hate to say that, but that's the truth. And that's why Desi is investing $50 million in recruitment and retention grants, because right now the workforce, the teacher workforce of Missouri is, is under duress. It's stressed, right? So we, have, we are hearing more and more signs and seeing more data that shows us that teachers are thinking about retirement. It was up 10% back in the spring uh, over the previous year. And Things haven't gotten better. After a stressful year last year, we didn't see a massive exit, but we saw some exodus happen, right? And I think a lot of people said, okay, last year was a blip on the screen, but this year, hopefully things will be different. And what we needed was a different normal start to the school year, and it, it's actually been anything but. And so we're left to wonder what's gonna be, what's gonna be the exodus this year? How many people are gonna say, I've had enough? And the, the fact of the matter is, the truth is, we don't have the supply coming to replace those folks if they go. And that means that the number one thing we can do to make sure that a kid's going to be successful down the road, we're, we don't have the, the asset to do it. We don't have the resource to do it. And that's what these grants are about. So we're giving every community college, every educator preparation program a grant to work on teacher recruitment. We're giving every public school district, every charter school a grant to work on teacher recruitment. We're also giving every public school and every charter school a grant to work on teacher retention about keeping them. We can recruit all that we want, but the solution is four years down the road before we can get them licensed in the classroom working. We've got to hang on to the teachers that we have now. And, and what we did is based on the data, what we did is we factored in areas of poverty and areas of color 
because that's where our biggest turnover happens. So when we have a massive exodus of teachers, it won't hit every school equally. It's gonna hit the very students that we worry about the most disproportionately. And so that's where we put more of our funds to try to slow down what's gonna happen there and hopefully change that trajectory. Cause right now, based on what I'm seeing, it's not, it's not looking positive. And that's, that's our big effort for this year. Okay, thank you. So how are your offices working together to improve educational outcomes and attainment? Uh, Paul, I can start with you this time. Well, our relationship goes back to 2014 when a law was passed and that said that we needed to have um, an advisory board for educator preparation called MABEP, Missouri's Advisory Board for Educator Preparation. And in law, it dictates that it has to be co-chaired by the two uh, the two uh, commissioners of education from each of the agencies or their designee, that ends up being uh, Mara and I, um, and it has to be 50% PK-12 and it has to be 50% higher ed. And that group has been meeting since 2014 and going back six years, uh, when they first got together, you could tell they didn't know much about what each other did. And since then, it's really been a, a journey of learning about how the each, each one operates. And the truth is they're married to each other, right? The, the outcomes, the the product produced by K-12 is what is needed by higher ed and the, the products that come out of higher ed is what's needed by K-12. So these, these folks are intimately married to each other and they don't even know it, right? So MABEP has been a great example of us kind of figuring out how to uh, work together, but there's been other things that we worked on together. There's a cumulative GPA rule that we got rid of back in January that, um, that MDUD helped us work on and uh, thankfully, we got that done. We're working on a dual credit project right now. And a big one I just want to mention here is Teach Missouri. And this goes back to recruiting and retaining teachers. We're launching a campaign right now um, around being a teacher and the and the honorable profession that it is. And we're asking that MDU join with us and partner with us to hold up Teach Missouri as uh, this, this recruitment campaign in our state that we're going to run for the next several years. We have our, um, we have our page kind of up and running. So if everybody would sometime today, put in teachmo.org and you can see the beginning of our work together, but it's something I think both agencies need to really push. So, uh, since I came onto the department a couple of years ago and I've had the opportunity to work with Paul, before I came to the department, what I knew was higher education and very little about K-12 education, which is amazing that we, we are, we intersect and we're married, but we don't know each other real well. And so it has really been an honor to be able to work with Paul and his team and uh, K-12 education to be able to really make some changes and then be able to really look at an entire education pipeline for the future. Um, the GPA requirement that got changed last year, like our role was small in that, but it was really great to be able to rally higher education around this is important and we believe in this and we want to support DESE as it tries to make this change. And so I really was happy to be able to be a part of that work. We also have our dual credit project that we're working on together that will start this spring semester. And that's really looking at uh, ways that we can update our dual credit policy or our requirements to see, you know, are, are we talking about those barriers? Are students not accessing dual credit like they could because of the requirements that we've set down for dual credit? And so we're really excited about uh, what we're going to see from that dual credit pilot and are there some changes that we can make because of it? And then um, anyone who attended the first equity summit and the hackathon knows that we have the MOES framework that came out of that. And that's another collaboration where we actually plan to launch next year communities of action, our first community of action. Uh, which is under that MOE's framework of working together to try to, for this specific one, solve the pipeline issue between high school, that transition to high school and to college. Um, maybe even from not being in college as an adult to being in college as an adult as well. And so we, we have a track record together. We continue to do so and we're planning future plans together as well. So in that marriage analogy, uh, we have future plans together uh, where we really do want to work and see it more holistically as the entire student pipeline, not just K-12 or higher education. Hey, thank you. 
So the next question is, how does diversity, equity, and inclusion fit into your department's strategic plan? And Mara, I'll, I'll kick it off to you first. Great. Well, this is actually a very timely question because both of our departments are in the middle of working on their strategic plan right now. I think both of them will be finalized towards the end of the year. So what we're talking about is more preliminary right now and what the plan is at the moment. Uh, but for dude's strategic plan, we actually have embedded equity targets into our strategic plan. And so we have our large goals and then we have within that our goals of how do we want to address and work with certain populations. So we have goals for minority populations. We have goals for rural populations. We have actual numerical goals for adult populations. We also, one of our principles is um, to be equity focused. And so that really you could tell in the conversations that we've had this last year about our strategic plan, you could see this focus on equity, equity playing out in those conversations and how we're setting our measures, how we're setting our goals and the initiatives that we're rolling out with. And so um, the plan isn't finalized yet, but we hope it will be in December as it gets approved by our board and we plan to launch in January. And so we believe that the initiatives you see next year will reflect what we've decided this year with our strategic plan and our focus on equity. Shoot to you, Paul. Yeah, Mara's right. We're, we're right in the midst of this right now. And much like um, our, our partners at MDUDE, um, Diversity, equity, inclusion is deeply embedded in in our four priority four priority areas that make up our strategic plan. The first priority area is early learning and early literacy, and that takes us back to the conversation kind of where we started. Right, um, this whole goal of having everybody read by third grade, and right now that's not happening. And for those students who can't yet read by third grade, we've we've set them up for a a really challenging rest of their school career in K-12 and, and questions about how successful they can be after that. And so a big push to get kids ready uh, for kindergarten to be sure we're tracking how well they're doing, checking reading scores in second grade, making sure that by the end of the third grade year that everybody reads, all students, all students read. Uh, the second priority area is success ready students and workforce development. And that really asks the question, after 12th grade, after graduation, what? What's coming next and how can we be sure that you're gonna be successful there? Whether you're heading off to college, whether you're heading into the military, whether you're heading into a two-year uh, program, whether you're heading into, um, into the workforce. Um, the whole point is for you to go and to be successful. And again, that's all students, all graduates, all graduates of our schools. Safe and healthy schools, which has taken on brand new meaning in the last uh, year and a half, uh, how do we keep our students safe and take care of them? Because you can't teach students who are fighting for basic needs in their life. And then the final one, and we've talked about it a lot already this morning, is educator recruitment and retention. And just to go back again to the research, it's unanimous. Quality of teacher, quality of teaching is what is the best opportunity for all students. And that's what we have to work on. And it's a big goal for us right now. It's a big challenge uh, because right now, um, we are in the midst of a teacher shortage and it was around before the pandemic, the pandemic exasperated it. And now here in the midst of it on the backside of the pandemic, if you will, we have no, we have no clue yet how it's going to have really affected it. And we, we have to be ready for that. We can't hope it all turns out. That's, that's not a good strategy. We have to be intentional, strategic uh, work to make sure every student, no matter what classroom they're sitting in, no matter where in the state they are, has a quality teacher standing in front of them that's going to keep moving them along that path to success. Great. Okay. So my last question is also my favorite kind of magic wand question. Okay. <laughs> so if you had unlimited resources and political capital, wouldn't that be nice um, to resolve one barrier in higher education, what would it be and how would you resolve it? Um, Paul, I'll start with you. Well, Sarah, if you're going to give me a magic wand, this is this is the one I want to tackle. It's minimum teacher salary. Um, right now, minimum teacher salary is twenty five thousand. And um, if you don't think there are teachers uh, working in this state who have a full degree and are teaching in their content area and earning twenty five thousand, you'd be wrong. There are. Um, when you can be a manager at McDonald's or work at Kohl's and earn more money than being a classroom teacher in the state of Missouri, that's a problem. Uh, what's a bigger problem is that our border states, all eight of them, 
you go kind of around the clock, you know, Iowa down to Illinois, eight border states, uh, their average uh, starting teacher salaries between 32 and 36 and Missouri sits at 25,000. I think even more alarming is that all of those border states, all eight of them have worked on their minimum salary in the past three years. And when I say worked on it, I mean, they vetched it up, they've moved it up. Illinois has plans to have theirs up to 40,000 uh, by 2024. And the last time Missouri touched their minimum salary was 2005. We're into year 16 of not moving that at all. Uh, minimum wage is doubled in that time period and we've not changed teacher salary. And I just can't, for all of you folks who are listening, I can't even begin to describe the challenges that that minimum salary imposes on our efforts to recruit and retain teachers. When 70% of students tell me, no, I'm not gonna be a teacher. Parents are like, I don't want my kid to be a teacher. They won't earn enough money. That's a real problem. It's a real barrier to us getting that number one research-based quality factor in education quality teacher that it's a huge it's a huge barrier and the final thing i want to say is it also communicates a message and for every one of us who are in education as long as that 25,000 minimum sits on the books it says education doesn't matter in this state and that should be something that all of us should be fighting for so you can uh, you can send the wand over as soon as you have it ready and um, that's the one i'm going after so then mine is also pretty similar to Paul, um, because what you're going to find, no matter what population you're talking about, it usually comes down to finances and resources are really the issue. And so mine would be similar to Paul's in that if I had a magic wand, I would want to be able to give institutions, higher education institutions, every dime they need in order to support their students. Because those same conversations that we have about we don't have enough resources to be able to do X, Every single campus in the state has had that same conversation that they wish they could do X, but they couldn't because there aren't the resources to do it. And I fully believe that if our institutions had full resources to do everything that they want to do, we wouldn't have equity issues anymore because they'd be able to take care of any of those problems. And so I'm with Paul. I think there needs to be an endless supply of money. And I think when it's endless, we both get it. So we can both work on K-12 and higher education together. But I think that's really where it is, is the priority has to be where the resources go. And if the priority is on education in Missouri, resources will go to education in Missouri. All right, well, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much, uh, Mara and Paul for having such a wonderful conversation today. And thank you for all that you do to ensure Missouri students can receive a quality education. I also want to take this moment to thank MOCAN, the Missouri College Access Network, for sponsoring our department's new conference landing website, eduvents.do.mo.gov. MOCAN's mission is to increase college and career readiness, preparation, access, and completion in Missouri, particularly for the underrepresented and underserved, and their mission aligns with the work that our department is doing, and we really appreciate its support. Let me explain a little bit more about how the rest of the morning is going to go. We are about to welcome a keynote speaker, Dr. Clarence Green, and two rounds of concurrent breakout sessions. The summit will close with an inspirational keynote presentation from Dr. Rolandus Rice, also known as the Dapper Dean. But don't worry if you can't decide which um, of the breakouts you want to pick, because all the presentations will be recorded and posted on the conference landing site, as well as the Missouri Department of Higher Education and Workforce Development website. You can access all the sessions, learn about the presenters, and connect with attendees using our conference landing site, uh, which we posted in the chat shortly. And up next is our keynote speaker, Dr. Clarence Green.